I want to thank our sponsors, Athletic Greens, who created AG1, one of the most innovative packets of supplements, including 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. These ingredients support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. I personally started using Athletic Greens and love the way I feel in the morning after I drink it. And I no longer have energy crashes throughout the day. And the best part is that it's delicious. The founder of Athletic Greens created AG1 because he experienced a ton of gut health and ended up on a complicated and expensive supplement routine to recover. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash yasmine. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash yasmine, Y-A-S-M-E-E-N, to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hi, my name is Yasmin Terehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Today's episode is about how to heal through seasonal herbs and listening to the body wisdom with Marisha Miranowska, an herbalist, teacher, author, earth activist, gardener, and green witch rooted in the wise woman tradition of healing. She teaches herbal medicine, regenerative farming practices, earth magic, and holistic healing, and is the creator of the School of the Sacred Wild. Her work and devotional practices are centered around the mission of supporting a deepening of the love and regenerative relationship between earth and people for the mutual healing of both human and plant communities. Marisha makes herbal medicine, runs a yearly apprenticeship program, consults on regenerative land care, design gardens, formulates for natural healing companies, and curates educational events. She's a writer, she speaks and teaches internationally, and she's the author of the book, The Witch's Herbal Apothecary, Rituals and Recipes for a Year of Earth Magic and Sacred Medicine Making. You can follow Marisha on Instagram and learn more about her apprenticeship. So welcome to the show, Marisha. So excited to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. So Marisha, you uh, structure your offerings and teachings around the seasons. Uh, Can you tell us, you know, why are the seasons so important for us to connect with and what do they have to tell us about our own well-being and wellness? Mm, Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I do. I teach with the structure of the seasons and uh, make medicine. in in accordance to the seasons and then also really plan my own creative energy and and my workflow um, very seasonally. And what's really incredible about the seasons is that they're kind of like our touchstone as human beings to connect with the natural cycles of nature that are ever renewing, ever regenerating. And so we live in a, a modern culture, you know, the capitalist culture is is very kind of linear and solar based if you will it's all about um being out there and and working long hours and and the days are always the same length of the, of the work and the expectations are the same and in that what i see as a healer is that a lot of people end up getting burned out there's too much of this fire solar um energy in our culture. But the earth and the seasons specifically offer us this wisdom that there is a time to be in that flame and that radiance and that solar power. But then after that, there's the time of the sunset or of the fall and the energy begins to wane in all of nature. And that's such an important season, that season of fall, of releasing the seeds, of giving gratitude and pausing for all the work and productivity that we've done and to prepare for a winter. And that season of winter is this season of deep rest, 
of really slowing down. And we see that with the animals that go into hibernation. We see that with the plant kingdom. A lot of plants will lose their leaves and and they look, you know, dormant or dead above ground. But in the soil, in that fertile, dark soil, that's where the energy is. And so the season of winter invites us also to go into the deeper places of our being spiritually emotionally, and also physically. You know, it's a great time to support deep immunity, of course. And then there's that natural awakening that just happens in the spring, right? And it's effortless. We see that again with the plants, you know, you'll have a a dormant rose, for example, and overnight, it seems, it just begins to sprout new shoots and and then there's a vigor there. There's this vigor of the earth awakening in the springtime. And so what we learn by living seasonally is that we can feel that regenerative energy of spring. We can awaken into new ideas, into more creative energy, into more vitality in our bodies and and in our world when we allow for that rest of winter, when we have carried ourselves through the relaxation and the winding down and the reflection of fall. And and the spring, of course, you know, it's beautiful to notice that the first plants that sprout in the spring are often the wild weeds. They're often plants that are a little bitter, right? Like dandelion greens or mustard greens. Many of them have yellow flowers. And when you learn the language of the plants, you'll see that that taste of bitter and the color yellow, it promotes the production of bile in the body. And so what we have here is the earth just giving us in abundance exactly the medicine that we need to wake up from the winter slumber, to help our body shed, you know, stagnation, to cleanse the blood, to promote more digestion and really awaken the body as well to to prepare ourselves for a new season. Uh, so that is so uh, phenomenal. Just the description, I just felt like it was poetry. <laughs> so thank you for that, Marisha. Um, I, I wonder uh, if that applies to places that maybe don't have strong distinctions between the seasons, like if there's more of a warmer climate, uh, a warmer temperament throughout the year. Um, does that still apply? Yeah, you know, I've thought about that a lot. I've never had the the privilege of living in a tropical climate, although I absolutely adore the tropics. But it's true that folks that are closer to the equator, you know, which I feel like are like the hips of the earth mama, um, they have that consistency of sunrise and sunset always, you know, being around 6 a.m., 6 p.m. Um, there's a real consistency um, in terms of daylight length of day. So they don't have that kind of natural um, inclination necessarily to to sleep more in the winter, right? Um, and then, of course, the weather patterns tend to, to be from dry season to wet season. So there are, of course, seasonal changes, but it is a little bit different than experiencing like the dark nights of winter if you live up north right? Or the kind of long days of summer, which are really the time in the Northern or Southern hemisphere to really produce your garden, right? So you have to, like nature again in those situations is giving us these long days so that we can really make food and and be out there so that we can then rest in the winter and, and have food preserved. Um, so, so while there isn't the same kind of rhythm of the seasons in the tropical areas and closer to the equator, what we still do have is the cycle of the moon. And so these cycles of nature, these regenerative currents of nature that go from this like rest, right, to rebirth and to growth and expansion and to reflection and seeding, we see that and can follow it by attuning ourselves to the cycles of the moon. The dark moon, when the moon is completely not shown in the sky, that is associated with the winter energy. It is a time when often we feel a little bit more inward. Many women-bodied people will will, will bleed at that time. There's a time where, you know, it is said that the the psychic veil is thinner, that you can can be um, in receiving more messages from spiritual realms. You feel a little bit more like hermiting, perhaps. 
And then that new moon, it offers us that same energy of, of the spring awakening. And people who work with the moon magically will often set a new intention on a new moon. And that's kind of like that energy of spring, right? There's something new that we are weaving into this monthly cycle. Wow. The full moon then corresponds with that summer solstice, with that that expansive, luminous, expansive, you know, energy, and and that's a, often a time for celebration, for for really giving gratitude and reflecting and celebrating ourselves for for that intention that may have sprouted into something, and and really just giving gratitude, and then as the moon begins to wane, um, there's an energy again of, of shedding. And for, again, female bodied people who happened to perhaps um, bleed with the new moon, ovulation happens on the full moon. And then after ovulation, there's that the body starts to, to shed and the hormones shift. And, and um, you know, often women will get PMS symptoms, right? Um, before they bleed. And I often really believe and see this with my clients and with my students that when we allow ourselves to enter that portal of the West, of, of the fall, of the waning moon, and harmonize our body and our energy with that energy of releasing, reflection, letting go, creating more space in our schedule, um, less responsibility, then women often don't have that kind of you know, what can sometimes feel like anger or snappiness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually very kind of primal protective energy of like, ah, leave me alone. This is overwhelming. You know, it's time for me to be releasing and getting darker so that I can really enter my moon. Um, mm. Yeah. So we have the, the moon cycles and then we have the day cycle too. You know, the, the midnight corresponds with that most dark energy and sunrise is the east, the spring. Noon is the sun in its zenith with the solar aspect, and sunset has that same energy of reflection that the fall can offer us. Wow. So powerful. And I, I love that because I think so many of us are disconnected from nature. And when I say the word nature, I mean, oftentimes people think about just the earth, but you know, you're know, you talking about the moon and our relationship with the cosmos, really. It's it's the whole, the entirety of, of the universe. Um, yeah. And I think so many of us are just completely disconnected from not just the, the cosmos or the, you know, the moon, but also the the earth entirely. I think we, we sort of operate our days as if we're a machine <laughs> rather yeah. than a human being. Uh, so Marisha, I have so many questions. Um, so what does it actually mean to eat with the season? Like what are some, maybe you could share your kind of go-to uh, herbs for all the different seasons and what would you yeah. tell a beginner to kind of start to do um, when it comes to eating yeah. with the seasons? That's such a great question. And I think it really bridges what you just shared. It's, it's so true. You know, so many people are living disconnected from the natural cycles of nature. And what I see is that it causes a lot of harm to us and to the earth. You know, um, as, as a healer, illness happens when we're disconnected from the cycles of nature. People that I see often have adrenal burnout, um, hormonal um, imbalances, and these are all symptoms of like pushing ourselves as if it was a perpetual summer. And, and your question about eating is so wonderful because that is something that is just so accessible to all of us, right? If we want to begin to live a little bit more seasonally and, and connect to the energies of the season for our health, and for the health of the earth and the planet at large, what we can begin with is this ritual that we partake with three times a day, right? Most of us maybe are eating three times a day, and those are three opportunities to actually weave our body and our consciousness into the earth and what she is experiencing and producing in that moment. So, you know, in the fall, that, that the energy of the earth is really in her roots. That's when us herbalists will dig up medicinal roots. We'll work with plants like burdock root or dandelion root, which tend to really support the liver. And, and we'll work with other roots that begin to build immunity like ashwagandha or astragalus. And then the foods are just so supportive of connecting to that energy of grounding. Um, the sweet potatoes, right? All of the, the squash family, um, 
any any carrots and beets, onions, any of the plants that grow in the earth are going to be grounding and are going to be balancing our hormones and really giving us the nutrition that we need and the kind of nourishment that will prepare us for the winter. In the winter, our digestion tends to be a little bit slower. We might not be moving as much. Um, We don't have access to all of the bitter, fresh greens that really promote digestion. And so it's a wonderful time to really focus on soups, blended blended soups and bone broths. Again, bone broths with uh, medicinal mushrooms like reishi or any of the mushrooms, shiitake, maitake, are going to be very deeply strengthening to kind of deep chi, to deep immunity. And, um, and you can also, you know, blend in some, some cooked vegetables for, for nutrition. And that's going to be really easy to digest and deeply nourishing and supportive of, of all of the systems. In the spring, like I mentioned before, you know, the earth wakes up with all of these fresh greens. And so we have an abundance of dandelion and, and mustard and nettles and oat straw and raspberry leaf and chickweed. These are all wild weeds that grow in abundance actually all over the world. And they are some of the kind of more ancestral food plants that that our ancestors have eaten. You know, they're the nettles, you can find them on every single continent on this planet and they grow in abundance and, and they're so packed with nutrition. These plants are incredibly rich in chlorophyll and in vitamins and in minerals and enzymes. And so they deeply nourish the body. They bring like this surge of green vitality and energy that we're craving after a long winter. And so really focusing on the greens in the spring and also incorporating some bitter flavor that the taste bitter is not often, um, something that the modern human, um, calls in and enjoys, but it's a taste that physiologically in our body begins to help our digestive system produce enzymes and, and acid, hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And so it's very important that we incorporate a little bit of bitterness um, into a meal. And you can even drink a little bitter tea before a meal to help wake up digestion and help you assimilate your nutrients, um, especially if you struggle with like gas or bloating or fatigue after a meal. Some of my favorite bitter teas are blue vervain, motherwort, mugwort. Um, There are really a lot, but the key is to make sure that you actually experience the taste of bitter in the mouth, because if you're adding honey, it's not going to work. It's the (laughs) taste of bitter in the mouth that signals to the digestive system to produce that bile. And then the summer, of course, we see these rich, abundant gardens full of ripe, juicy tomatoes and juicy watermelons and juicy cucumbers. And so we're noticing that the earth is giving us abundant food for hydration. So that is a wonderful time to really be enjoying a lot more fruit and a lot of these fresh vegetables. If you're being overheated by the summer, then a lot of those vegetables that I just mentioned are very cooling, cucumber, mint, watermelon, they, they cool the body down. And so you can kind of support your body um, with the plants that are, that are really abundant at that time. Wow. And uh, Marisha, what do you see as like kind of a modern um, ailment across the board with people who are kind of not eating by the seasons? Because like, I'm just sort of thinking, wow, I think it seems like we eat and work like it's a perpetual summer. <laughs> um, and so what does that mean for our bodies? Are we just like, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting when you look at it energetically, right? Um, that perpetual summer is the energy of fire. And when you are in a perpetual fire, what happens is you burn out, right? You burn out. And that is one of the main symptoms that I am seeing across the board. People are tired. Their adrenals are wiped. Their kidneys are taxed. Um, Their body is really tired. And the earth is tired of this perpetual summer, right? That perpetual doing the doing, doing, doing more, 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 consuming, consuming, consuming is leading to wildfires. 
It's leading to climate change. We're seeing that element of fire that is, is really creating a lot of destruction. And that perpetual summer, that hyper productivity, it, it really lends itself to this extractive culture that we live in. And so the earth is being taken from and, and the deep reservoirs of, of her vitality, of her nourishment, of the health and the balance of her ecosystems is not being replenished because we are not living cyclically in reciprocity supporting her re- regeneration. Mm, that's so powerful because I think a lot of people who think about eating for the seasons, it's such a kind of egocentric way of thinking about our relationship with the earth. It's like, what can the earth do for me? But the way that you always, that you're talking about it is like, this is a two-way relationship. And I yeah. think a lot of us have forgotten about that. Uh, Marcia, I want to talk about, this is something that that I read in your book and I just loved and I was so kind of blown away by how I just didn't know about it. Um, but the, the yin and yang of all the different drinks that we could have in the morning and how, because um, I think I started to actually drink a lot of uh, cacao, you know, it's kind of my, my ritual every morning. Um, and then I noticed on your list that cacao was a very yang energy. So a lot of um, and you can describe this better, like what that means, the yin and the yang and, and how things like coffee, um, you know, and cacao and all the other drinks fit on that scale. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just to kind of preface that by, by, you know, honoring that the yin and yang theory comes from traditional Chinese medicine and, and from the Asian culture. Um, and, and it is something that, um, you know, it, in other words, can be also be translated as yin being lunar or feminine, yang being associated with solar or masculine, yin being kind of descending in the body, like yin foods tend to ground us, yang foods and herbs tend to disperse energy. You can think of ginger and how, you know, it can make us sweat and and move energy out. So we can use the the words yin and yang. Um, I think it's an easy way to to kind of um, talk about this, but um, but the energy is is kind of um, cross cultural and, and universal and energetic, right? So so the yin also connects more to the earth and water element. Those are the elements that are very yin. So they're they're more damp. They're grounding. They're nourishing. And the yang element connects to air and fire again more dispersing energizing stimulating so it's a wonderful thing to think about it's it's it mirrors that in breath and the exhale that we have and the in breath and the exhale of nature and the rising sun and the setting sun it, it mirrors right these cycles of nature that we were just talking about and so you can kind of tune in with your body and notice Are you attracted to stimulants, right? Are you drawing on kind of stimulating herbs, yang herbs, some of the more yang stimulating plants that we use for these drinks? Of course, coffee is the most yang of all of them. (laughs) And and maybe like an espresso or a double espresso would be the most, 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 right? It's it's incredibly stimulating um, to the body. And I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about the ones you're curious about in more detail, but I'll kind of go over it generally. Um, then like the most yin, the most kind of nourishing, grounding, nutritive, moistening, grounding would be an overnight cold infusion of nettles, for example, or a nourishing herb. And this is kind of one of the practices that I teach as as one of the first practices that I share with students. And, um, in my book as well, we really, in my tradition of healing, really lean on the wild weeds, the nourishing herbs, the plants that are abundant and free and local. And and that's so important. That allows us to be healthy and allows the earth to be healthy because we're not chasing some, you know, extravagant herb from a specific ecosystem Hmm. only to then deplete the balance of that ecosystem, right? There's a reason that the earth is giving us these wild weeds in such abundance everywhere. And so the practice of making an over night infusion of a nourishing herb is the staple in in my practice and for my students and my clients. And it involves essentially taking a handful of like dried nettle or dried oat straw or red raspberry leaf or chickweed and putting it in a 32 ounce jar 
if you will, covering it with cold water, shaking it, and letting it sit overnight. And by the morning, you have this green, nourishing infusion of, of all of the nutrients and vitamins and minerals of that plant that are so bioavailable. And if you drink that first thing in the morning, it just floods your body with nourishment and with a different kind of energy than coffee. It's a grounded, regenerative energy that, that replenishing you, right? So that would be kind of probably the most yin drink. And then from there, from that most yin cold infusion, right? Uh, any tea made with a hot water would be just a little bit more yang. Um, warm lemon water is a very nice kind of neutral um, way to start the day. It's very cleansing to the liver, very cleansing to the organs, very hydrating, very nice way to start the day. I highly recommend that everyone start the day first by drinking some plain water and then having a cup of warm lemon water. And then there are some herbs that are more stimulating that have that kind of yang property. Shisandra is my favorite. I love Shisandra. It's a very energizing berry and, and it's an adaptogen and um, it's incredible for adrenal health, for hormonal balance, for mental clarity, for digestive health, for the heart. It's really phenomenal. And it's actually energizing. Like when you drink it, you, you feel it as a pick me up. Hmm. Um, Cacao would be more yang than shisandra. Cacao can be a little drying. As we get into the more yang plants, they have a drying effect on the body. And cacao is going to have a little bit more of a drying effect. It has caffeine. So it is, again, stimulating. It is a bitter. It's a natural bitter. So it's going to also kind of stimulate the digestive system, which is really nice. Um, and it's filled with minerals, wonderfully, incredible. You know, that there's a reason they call it the food of the gods. It's, a, it's truly a divine plant. Um, from there, a caffeinated tea or like yerba mate would be another way to kind of stimulate the body. Matcha can be very stimulating, full of antioxidants, delicious. And then coffee would be our most yang beverage of the morning. Wow. Uh, that's so fascinating. Uh, I have not heard of Shisandra uh, and a couple of the others that you mentioned. So I'm very excited to try these out myself. Uh, and I plan to take your apprenticeship this fall. So whoever is listening and wants to join me, uh, I believe that starts in September, correct? Yeah, it starts on the fall equinox. Amazing. Uh, so Marisha, what is one of your favorite rituals? Um, reading your book, I saw that there were so many beautiful rituals in there. And I think that, um, at least for me, I, I find that creating a ritual in the morning um, and evening is sort of an honoring of my own humanity and relationship with nature and my body. I I'm curious if you have one in particular that... Um, means a lot to you and perhaps is something that you could share with our audience? Yeah. Um, I do have a lot of rituals and, and, and the rituals are really just embodied ways of dropping into a deep, open-hearted, full sensory relating with the earth and with spirit. Um, I'd love that about rituals. I think they get us out of our head, you know, and they get us into our body. And, and from that place, we're able to move energy and, and access deeper parts of our consciousness. So one of my favorite rituals is definitely um, what I call the earth whispering ritual. And it involves um, the act of laying your body on the earth. Even that alone can be the most profound ritual of, of the day. And, and, having our skin touching the earth every day, even if it's for five minutes, 10 minutes, it has a profound effect on the body. Now, a lot of scientists are, are saying that 20 minutes of earthing, right? They call it earthing now when you walk barefoot on the beach or, or on the grass, um, it can reduce inflammation by 80% in the body. So it's very anti-inflammatory. It calms the nervous system. It opens the heart and it helps us get out of this kind of um, really like a perpetual anxiety that I feel the modern person is in. And that anxiety kind of like, it makes sense that if we're not touching the earth and we come from the earth and to earth, we will return, then we're disconnected. 
And our nervous system is communicating, you guys, <laughs> we need to root down. We are like the plants. We're, we're more similar to the plants and the animals than we give ourselves credit for. It's kind of, you know, like taking a, a, a rose bush and, and digging it out of the earth and then just leaving it like that. It'll continue to live for, you know, a few days, but eventually it's going to start wither. And, and, and before that, it'll start panicking. And so our bodies are meant to be touching the earth. So just the ritual of going outside every day and touching the earth or laying on the earth, if you can, if you have access to a little bit of patch of, of grass or, or anything that's uncovered earth is going to be phenomenally healing. Then this ritual that I love is one that involves first laying on the earth on your back and just closing your eyes and, and letting yourself drop in. And you feel after, ah, you know, after a few breaths, you feel your energy kind of leaving the, the nervous system, the mind, and, and you start to relax and you feel like, okay, I feel grounded. I feel connected. At that point, you flip over with your belly and your heart against the earth. And there is just a whole second wave of energy that begins to pull down into the earth. You can feel an even deeper release. It feels like coming home. It feels like laying your body on, on the breast of the great mother. It's truly exquisite. Even for those who are not connected to earth-based spirituality, it's so relaxing and nourishing. Mm. And, and from there, this, this earth whispering ritual involves connecting to the prayers that you have in your heart. And we always try to include prayers for ourselves, but also prayers for the earth. And we begin by, you know, laying with our face so close to the earth, with our belly on the earth, and we ask the earth permission to open her. And if we feel a yes, we dig a little hole with our hands just under our face. And the hole can be about the size of, of like if you were to cup your hands together and so that the hole can fit your chin up until the rim of your nose and, and your forehead can rest on the earth. And you dig this little hole with a lot of reverence and presence and you rest your face in it so you can breathe, but your third eye and your and your forehead is, is resting against the earth. And you have this, it's like a direct access to speak into the mother. And from there, there's this incredible feeling of, of intimacy that comes in. And, and this feeling of it's just you and her and her flesh listening to your voice, your lips so close to her soil. And from there, you can speak into her body and speak to, to spirit, to, you know, whoever you connect with as, as the force of creation. And, and often there's an amazing ability to just release what's weighing on our heart. You know, so often as humans, we're carrying stress and we're worrying about maybe our children or the state of the world or a relationship, whatever it might be. And to be able to just kind of unload and talk to her like you were talking to the greatest mother. And then from there, it can feel natural to just pray, to ask, to ask for help or to seed intentions into the soil and always just remembering to pray for her well-being, for her wholeness, and for humanity to awaken to the blessing that it is to be receiving from her every breath we take, every meal we eat, every sip of water that we, we take. And, and, you know, praying for that relationship to, to be restored and to balance. Mm. And then from there, you can cover that, you know, you can cover that hole and, and say thank you. And I was, you know, always say it's nice to ask for forgiveness for opening her as well. And it's nice to add, make an offering to give her something. Uh, a dear friend of mine shared that, that a real gift is something that hurts a little when you give it away. So it, it shouldn't be just like a stone or a crystal that's collecting <laughs> dust on your altar. It should be something that hurts a little bit. And, and maybe it's something you made or, um, or it can also be a song. My grandmother taught me to leave a strand of my hair when I, when I take a plant or harvest a plant. So just something to really, again, feed that, that energy of reciprocity. Beautiful, Marcia. Um, 
Wow. Just as you were speaking, it just felt uh, so grounding just to visualize that image of the connection to the earth. Uh, Marcia, I want to talk a little bit about your own personal journey. You mentioned your grandmother and um, I think you make it's very obvious in public um, that you are from Poland um, and very proud uh, to to be from Poland. And I'm I'm super curious how your journey, um, especially with your lineage, uh, can impacted you and and encourage you to sort of be a warrior in this work and to sort of lead people um, into this connection with the earth. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey and um, and how you how did you get here. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting you use the word warrior because there's definitely a strong current of, of incredible female badassery (laughs) in my, in my family and in my lineage. And it's something I've been very proud and, and very, you know, it's, it's, I feel very blessed, very blessed. I see uh, what a blessing it has been in my life to feel my grandmothers and my ancestors and to be able to, um, to feel you know, the, the knowingness of, of what they did in their lives. Um, but a lot of my, my ancestors, you know, my, my immediate grandmothers and grandparents were all, um, activists and, and just normal citizens who, when the second world war broke out in Poland, um, suddenly, you know, couldn't return home, couldn't see their parents. And, and essentially all of them were organizing against the Nazis and, and, were fighting the Nazis, smuggling Jewish people out of Poland, smuggling weapons into the country, um, really, you know, really um, putting their lives at risk, of course, obviously, and 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 doing so because of a deep, uh, rooted knowing that 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 is what is right. And so I was raised with, you know, a heavy dose of, of this kind of uh, Roman Catholic Polish morality, <laughs> as well as with like a heavy dose of, of intellectual um, activism. My, my parents are both professors and, and were activists, um, you know, in the solidarity movement when Poland was then occupied by Russia. And, and I've always been taught to, to really use my voice for for the oppressed and for justice and to um take risks you know my my mom um she was a teacher um and and there was a somebody coming from the USSR and and she was told by the administration of her school that they had to, the kids had to come out and wave to this um to this person um and she refused to do so and she lost her job and so these were the stories that i grew up with you know a real strong messaging around um around, um, really doing what is right is the most important. Um, and so I have, I think had a lot of fire in my work. Um, a lot of maybe fire in myself, I should say, cause my work actually feels more earthy and watery. It, it balances me out. Um, but I do feel a really deep sense of devotion, um, and a strong commitment to, making my life into medicine as best as I can, you know, and to, um, serving my community and, and people and the plants and the earth and those who are non-human and who do not have a verbal voice, um, as best as I can. And, um, I learned a lot about the plants from my grandmothers and, um, you know, herbalism and folk herbalism is very alive um, and well in, in actually most parts of the world. Um, and it's not even something that people will call themselves herbalists. You know, they just know what plants to, to which common herbs to use for which common ailments. Um, and then I received further training from Sage Maurer, who founded the Gaia School of Healing and Earth Education in Vermont. And Sage is just incredible. She's such an incredible teacher and activist and, and such an incredible soul. And and she's been a dear, beloved sister of mine and and the godmother to my daughter. And, and, um, and she really helped me in a moment where I was coming back to these plants, coming back to them. When I was going through my own healing crisis, I, I was studying architecture and ended up getting very burned out, um, ended up in Vermont in the woods. And, and I met her and, and, um, it, it helped me remember, you know, it helped me remember, the plants that my grandmothers always were, were giving me and, and, um, and yeah, so that's been, that's a little bit about my background. Wow. 
Fascinating. Uh, so, Marisha, I'm sad to say we're uh, almost at time. I could talk to you for hours about this. Uh, but what has surprised you the most on this journey? I mean, if you look back on your on all the the tutelage and the also the teaching and everything that you've done, what has surprised you the most about your, I guess, your audience as well as the work itself? Yeah, that's what a great question. I mean, the thing that comes up right away is, is there's a sweet feeling of surprise that, that there are so many people that are interested now in herbalism. You know, when I, um, was starting, it was very much kind of like a fringe thing. Um, and now of course it's, it's kind of, you know, very popular and, and almost fashionable, I would say. And, and there's a lot of people, um, you know, from the quote unquote mainstream who are really authentically interested and, and who recognize the value of knowing how to take care of their children and their families and themselves. Um, and so I'm really pleasantly surprised by how mainstream permaculture, herbalism, um, you know, health and wellness is becoming. And I think with that, we have to remember that when we are rooted in a mainstream culture and we were all born into this capitalist society that is very extractive, you know, we can have compassion for ourselves for that. And we also have to take responsibility to make sure that we are not approaching these forms of um, herbal medicine or wisdom traditions with the same extractive colonial mindset, you know, of like, can I get from this? <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, can I do a career right away or what can I sell? You know, we have to really kind of compost some of these, some of these ways that, you know, we are just born into. Um, and, and so that's my prayer as, as, you know, as these important ways of, of relating and knowing the earth and ourselves become more and more accessible and popular. Um, you know, I offer my deep blessing to that. And then I offer also, um, the invitation, the need, the request, the requirement for us to make sure that we're walking in a good way, as they say, and, and relating from, from a place of, of reciprocity. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, Marisha, any last words and where can people find you? Are there any resources that you can point folks to in order to learn more about you, your work and the upcoming uh, apprenticeship? Yeah. So you can find um, me on my school website, which is schoolofthesacredwild.com. And I'm also on Instagram, my name, Marisha Mirnowska, which is a a handful to spell. Um, I also have a a raw organic... um, regenerative beauty line called Ritual Sacred Beauty. And that's also on Instagram and and on the internet. Um, I have my book, The Witch's Herbal Apothecary, which you can get at any any library or bookstore, um, as well as on my website. I think those are most of the places. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Marisha, thank you so much for your time. I am so excited about this work and have just personally heard about the folks doing your program, how incredible it is. I, I think I heard uh, one of your um, students say, I think I'm going to take this class every year because <laughs> it's so good and so rich. Um, so I'll be signing up and I hope that those of you who are listening will check it out as well. So for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learn about seasonal herbs and listening to the body wisdom. Uh, and you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Thanks again. <laughs>